Venereal diseases were everywhere in the land of Canaan. They were corrupt, they were decadent, and it was only when they reached the point of no return that God said, now you can have their land. So any uh, complaint about God's injustice in giving that land to the Jews is quite mistaken. But he had to keep them out of the land until the state of the people in that land was so bad that uh, being pushed out of it was just judgment. But there were other reasons too. God wanted them to become slaves. It was all part of his plan to rescue them from slavery so that they would be so grateful to him they would then live his way and become a model for the whole world to see of how blessed people are when they live under the government of heaven. That was the plan. And so he let them get into such problems, working seven days a week, no pay, no land of their own, no money of their own, nothing of their own. And it was then that he reached down and rescued them with his mighty hand. So that you see, it all had to happen. And God let it happen for his own purposes. He wanted to redeem them and rescue them so that they would know it was God who got them out and into their own land. So that's God's angle on the story. But we still haven't really got to the heart of the story. The next approach or level at which we could read it would be a study of Joseph's character. And this is a very remarkable thing. Because there is nothing said about Joseph that is bad. Now we've seen already that the Bible tells the whole truth about Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and they certainly had their weaknesses and sins. But not one word of criticism is leveled at Joseph. I've told you already the worst thing he ever did which was just to be a bit tactless and tell his brothers about the dream. But there's no trace whatever of a wrong attitude or reaction in Joseph's character. Even his reactions to going all the way down the social ladder. There's no trace of resentment, no complaining, no saying, why has God done this? No, no sense of injustice that he should finish up in prison on death row in Pharaoh's jail. Furthermore, even though he was far from home and totally unknown, he maintained his integrity when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him. And when she tried, his reaction was, how could I sin against God like this? And you know that she falsely accused him then, which put him on death row in the jail. But not one word of criticism, even of Potiphar's wife. This is an astonishing portrait. Furthermore, the man, even at rock bottom, his concern seems to have been primarily to help others. There was Pharaoh's cupbearer and his baker on death row. And Joseph sought to comfort them. He is a man who seems to have no concern for himself, but a deep concern for everybody else. And all the way down, he never once questioned God, never once doubted that God knew what he was doing, whereas we do. And then his reaction to going up to the top. I don't know which is the bigger test of a man's character being taken all the way down to the bottom or being lifted up to the top. I think probably the second is the biggest test of his character. But look at his reaction to the brothers who'd sold him into slavery. He gave them food. And he wouldn't charge them for it. He put the money back in their sacks. He forgave them with tears. He interceded for them with Pharaoh and he purchased for them the best land in the Nile Delta, a land called Goshen, and said, I'm going to look after you. They'd thrown him out and told his old daddy was dead. But here he is providing every need of theirs. What a man. So Joseph is unspoiled either by humiliation or by honor. He's a man of total integrity. He's the only one so presented in the Old Testament. There isn't any other character presented like this. Even King David, you know what his faults were. 
And you will find in every other full portrait we get the whole picture. But here the whole picture seems to be blameless. It's very unusual. We read of David's sin. We read of Elijah's cowardice. We read all the weaknesses. And we know that as the New Testament says of Elijah, they were men of like passions to ourselves. But here's a man who has utter integrity. There's only one person in the Old Testament like this and there's only one person in the New Testament like this. You know who that is. Now there is one chapter in the middle of the story of Joseph that comes as a shock. It's about his brother Judah. And if you've read through Genesis recently, you must have felt what a shock it is. Suddenly in the middle of the story of this good man, there is actually a contrast in his own brother Judah. A man who visits a prostitute who is actually his daughter-in-law with a veil on and incest happens and it's a sordid story. And suddenly that story comes right in the middle of Joseph. It's almost as if to highlight Joseph and to say his brothers were bad people, but Joseph wasn't. The contrast is marked. I can only think of that as the reason why that sordid instant instance of Judah is put right suddenly in the middle with no connection as if just as Abraham had a contrast with Lot and Ishmael with Isaac and Jacob with Esau it's as if he is a brother who highlights the integrity of this man so we're getting very near to the reason why the story of Joseph is there but we haven't yet got there I want you to put together in your minds the three levels at which we have discussed this story so far. The human story of a man who was taken all down to the bottom and then right up to the top and who became and is called the saviour of his people and the lord of Egypt. Then we're looking at God's overruling of this man's life that he allowed that to happen and planned it to save his people. And then we've looked at a man of total integrity who all the way down and all the way up remained a man of truth and honest goodness. Who does that remind you of? The answer is Jesus himself. Joseph becomes what we call a type of Jesus, a foreshadowing of Jesus way back in the Old Testament. It's as if God is showing us in the life of Joseph what he was going to do with his own son. That his own son like Joseph would be rejected by his brethren and taken all the way down to utter humiliation and then raised to be saviour and lord of his people. It's all there. And the parallels are remarkable. And the more you read the story of Joseph, the more you see this picture of Jesus as if God all along knew what he was going to do and was going to give hints to his people. We find that all the way through the Old Testament. One of my favorite little books is called Christ in All the Scriptures by a lady called Mrs. A.M. Hodgkin. Any of you know it? Lovely little book. And she just goes through every one of the 66 books in the Bible and shows us Jesus in that book. You see, Jesus himself said, search the Scriptures for they bear witness of me. And yet he's talking about the Old Testament. Now when you read the Old Testament, you should be looking for Jesus, for his likeness, for his shadow. Jesus is himself the substance, but his shadow falls right across the pages of the Old Testament, and especially in Genesis. Now once you've seen that, that Joseph is a picture of Jesus, of God's answer. As Abraham, Isaac and Jacob are models of our faith in God, Joseph is a model of God's response to that faith and how he can take the life of a man and deliver his people from their need and lift him up to be Saviour and Lord. Once you've got that key, you start turning back the pages of Genesis, and suddenly you find Jesus in so many different places. And I just want to take you through five of them. There are others that you can look for. The first, all the genealogies of Genesis are in fact the genealogy of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And if you read Matthew 1 and Luke 3, you'll see those genealogies. You'll find in Luke 3, 24 names from the book of Genesis. He is in this line of Seth. That line comes straight down to the son of Mary. So we're reading his life line. And if you are in Christ, you are reading your own family tree. This is our genealogy. These are the most important ancestors we have. Because through faith in Christ, you become a son of Abraham. You become part of this line. You are in Christ. And you've inherited this history. So you're not reading about their history now. You're reading about our history now. This is your family tree. Uh, My wife and I went to Petworth House. That's not far away from here, is it? A bit further east, not long ago for a day out. And uh, that was owned by the Dukes of Northumberland, the Percys. And coming from Northumberland, I was very interested. I went to college with one of the Percys. And uh, so I was interested when I said, it's a 